started. So hello, we're going to continue where we started last time, in, uh, and that is shell balances. The chapter in the textbook is the chapter number two, and today we're actually going to complete that first example uh, that is 2.1. Uh, let me just open up my notes. So we started discussing a thin film going down the slope. Um, this is something that is very common in applications. Of course, in any kind of lubrication, you're going to have thin films, films and surfaces that allow things to happen. So this is where uh, this is applicable. In petroleum engineering, you will have uh, condensing fluids, for instance, on the side uh, of the wellbore, or you might actually decide to treat the side of the wellbore in in order, for instance, uh, to prevent asphalt moves from building up and things like that. So coating of all kinds uh, is, uh, co coating of all kinds and for all kinds of purposes is where study of these thin films uh, might uh, be very useful. Now we are starting a very simple example and very simple geometry, which is going to be, it's going to be a Cartesian coordinate system. Uh, but essential ideas should apply anywhere. So basically variations of this problem would be, so this is going to be a Newtonian fluid, a Newtonian incompressible fluid. One variation would, of course, to go with non-Newtonian because a lot of uh, coatings will actually be uh, fluids that are like thin film fluids and so forth. We're going to discuss those later that are non-Newtonian. Um, and you could also change the geometry. So, of course, I could actually coat a thin film on the sides of the wellbore as opposed to going down the slope. So, you can change this up in various ways. And actually, when it actually comes down to having an exam that is testing this, um, none of the exam questions will be all that surprising. But they might still take three pages to solve. So basically what we go through is actually a very essential solution procedure that you will be applying over and over. And I could even tell you precisely what example I'm going to give you an exam, and it still might take you a moment to solve it even if you know precisely what I'm going to tell you to do. So again, uh, once you get the homework on this, all of these examples such as this, or uh, so geometries could be down the slope, it could be thin plates, like two, two parallel plates, which is basically a fracture of sorts that is very common in engineering. Uh, you could have cylinder, you could have annulus, and flow around the sphere. Those are essentially the geometries, the simplified geometries that kind of everything comes down to. If you're in the type of engineering where you're creating your system, okay, then basically all of your created uh, spaces, such as uh, tubes of various sorts, we, for instance, have cylindrical geometry, the one that you can predict. In petroleum engineering, we often cannot predict what the fracture is going to be like that we're going to encounter in subsurface, but we're often going to simplify it to two parallel plates. So these are, again, the range of geometries that I mentioned is a very basic, so all of the variations of these problems are basically varying the types of geometry and possibly the types of fluids that we're looking at. For the most part, we're going to look at the very slow flow. Uh, so in those, the, the, the governing equations are nonlinear, so if you have faster velocities, you could easily get onset of turbulence which is a whole different theory that we're not going to cover here, not in great detail anyway. Okay? So for the most part, we're going to uh, deal with the very simple assumptions, but that doesn't mean that the solutions will necessarily be very simple. Okay? It's simply the nature of very nonlinear equations that govern this. So back to, again, this was sort of just to motivate you what's going to come after this, because we're going to go through a range of examples, but again, it's not even all that surprising what's going to come on your exam, but it still takes a moment to get 
uh, to get through these solutions and to be efficient and fast while solving these problems. So let's get going with this one. We said we have steady laminar flow of a Newtonian incompressible fluid and it's a down uh, gently sloped wall. So I exaggerated the geometry here. I have delta which is the film thickness. I have beta which is the angle that defines the slope. Okay? And my slope is long, it has length L and width W. Okay? And essentially we assume a, a, a slow flow going down and I'm going to introduce a coordinate system and I'm going to choose a red color to do so. So I'm going to essentially put two axes, well three but one of them I'm going to ignore. So I'm going to have x direction pointing downwards, z direction pointing down the slope, and y direction going into the paper. And this y I'm going to essentially ignore because I assume everything is the same, every cross section that I take into this wall. Okay, so we can basically choose coordinate system. X, Y, Z. Okay. So basically we, we only have to uh, look at X and Z direction because Y is not all that much of interest. Now we are looking into momentum transfer for this problem and one concept that going, that's going to help us in describing this momentum is this combined momentum tensor. Okay. And we're going to have to look at all of the individual, uh, individual components of this uh, tensor. So first we will actually so recall that phi is a combined momentum tensor. And it has all of the possible momentum transfer mechanisms built within except for the body force. Body force we look at separately. Okay? So we're going to have inside molecular and convective mechanisms of momentum transfer built within. And that's why you actually want to look at phi because that way you're not going to overlook any of the mechanisms that you might have. Okay? So that's why we actually defined it. So let's actually look at, so I'm going to separately draw, this is too exaggerated, I'm going to separately draw a smaller coordinate system and I'm going to outline in that coordinate system a shell, so a sort of a small volume element that I'm going to analyze over okay. and that's what we refer to as shell. So this is my x and this is my z this starts at some point x and it goes from x to x plus delta x and this starts at some point z to z plus delta z okay. now by definition what did we call phi z z phi x z what did I say that phi x z is? <coughs> the combined momentum transfer of what across what? So z momentum across a plane or z direction or a z plane okay? and if I'm looking at x z I'm looking at the transfer of z momentum across x. If I flip it over, I'm going to have phi zx as x momentum across z plane. So let's say that like first I'm actually, obviously I'm going down the slope, so really what I'm after is this velocity in z direction. Okay, that's kind of what I'm here. And I'm going to actually assume that actually nothing is, that there's no mixing in x direction for this film. It's going so slow that it's kind of like just orderly going down the slope. 
okay, without any fluid actually going downward. And that I can do if it's like a really gentle slope. Okay? So essentially, I'm going to look at, the, the first thing that we want to look at is Z momentum transfer. So my phi ZZ is essentially on its transfer across this Z plane. Okay. So it shows up on these two sides of my shell volume. Okay. And since I'm in a coordinate system, this part I'm going to say it's coming in, and this part it's coming out. Okay. So basically I have my phi ZZ. Whoops, I have touched something. Okay, okay. Phi Z Z. And I'm going to have a notation Phi Z Z at Z, meaning I'm evaluating it for this Z direction. And here I'm having Phi Z Z at Z plus delta Z. Now this phi x z goes across x plane, okay? So I'm imagining that that's the transfer that's happening on these two sides that are for constant x, so they're my little x planes. So this is going to be phi x z at x, and this is going to be phi x z at x plus delta x. Again, notation is I don't want to meddle what is this phi function of. I'm just evaluating it for x plus delta x and everything else is constant. Or I'm not interested in looking at it. Oh, did I say x plus delta z? That's an interesting. Okay. So if I'm thinking of what's coming in, well, there is this contribution coming in and this contribution coming in. It's just that, so this is a stress, so stress by itself is normalized by the area. To actually see how much is coming in, I have to multiply it with the area that it's coming in through, okay? So basically I have to do that. And this is where I'm basically going to look at the rate of transfer in. It's my phi x z at x and phi z uh, phi z z at z multiplied by area, and what's coming out is phi x z at x plus delta x. So it's these other two and phi z z at z plus delta z again multiplied by area. So once I'm summing out the contribution, I actually have to have sort of an absolute value of what's coming in, and that I get by multiplying by the appropriate area. Okay? Okay? So now we're actually going to put that into equation. So which area, this side in, this side, right, it has it's delta x if I'm looking at it in 2D, but I'm going to add that dimension into the, uh, into the paper, which was uh, length w. So I'm just looking just to have the units correct, okay? So basically, this area, uh, area that is of, of a z-plane is delta x times w, and the area of the x-plane is delta z times w, okay? So those are my appropriate areas. Let me switch the paper. Okay. So rate of stuff coming in, in at x, I'm going to actually write it down. So actually I'm going to pose it as rate in at x is equal to x minus rate out at x is equal to x plus delta x plus rate in at 
z is equal to z minus what's coming out at the opposite side so that is my balance of this combined momentum transfer and then we say okay body forces are not included so I'm just gonna add z direction body forces And I'm going to look at the steady state solution. Therefore, all of these contributions have to sum up to zero because I have no accumulation within my element. So again, this is because we're looking at steady state. Okay. So rate in at x is equal to delta x. That's my phi xz evaluated at x times the area and area is delta z times w what's coming out is on the opposite side so it's phi x z evaluated at x plus delta x and area is the same which is the beautiful thing about Cartesian coordinate system areas cancel out So if you're in a cylindrical coordinate system, your lengths are changing with your different, with your distance from the center, uh, from the central axis. And then for z, we're going to have phi z z at z, and the area is delta x times w minus phi z z evaluated at z plus delta z times the same area. Now, body force is going to be gravity. That's most of the time the body force we're going to account for. And in this sense, we are just going to look at the projection of gravity in the z direction because I'm looking at the z direction right now. Okay? So I'm looking at vectors, and I'm like, like right now I'm looking at the z, z direction of the vector. Okay? So basically my projected... It's going to be rho g cosine beta. So this is density times gravity. So I need to do density times volume in order to get my... Uh, and volume of the element is my delta x delta z times w. That's my volume of my shell. So this is volume of the shell. It's going to be close, but we're going to leave it in because we know it may as well. Because then ultimately, you, then you don't have a slope; you just have nothing, nothing moving. So something has to be there to move it. Okay. So this is where I can cancel Ws. I kind of put W in just to have the units right. And I can also actually divide by delta x delta z. So I'm going to note that like this, divide everything by delta x delta z. I use kind of this type of notation a lot. So when I do that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to annotate this this part here. So I have phi x z evaluated at x and phi x z evaluated at x plus delta x times delta z. So when I divide, I'm going to have divided by delta x and I'm going to write it as a phi x z negative phi x z x x plus delta x. So this is similar to integration. That means that it's phi x z evaluated at x plus delta x minus phi x z evaluated at x. Okay, similar as when you're doing integration in calculus. And divided by delta x. Is everybody comfortable with this? We're going to use this a lot. Minus and similar thing is happening with phi z z. It's just that I'm going to have z and z plus delta z.
divided. So when I divide by delta x, delta z, I'm going to have divided by delta c. And plus rho g cosine beta. Everything is equal to zero. So this is what's happening at one small element. I can now let it shrink. Okay. So mathematically shrinking is when I take the limit when delta x goes to zero and delta z goes to zero. So this is a divided difference. When I let the delta x go to zero, it's going to partial derivative. And I'm going to denote partial derivatives like this. So this is partial derivative of xz with respect to x. Minus this is a partial derivative, however, with respect to z. And there's not, no delta x and delta z in this term, so it remains as is. So this is the main process. I identified the shell. I figured out the contributions of stuff that is transferring across the boundary. That's where this combined momentum transfer stress tensor helps me out. And that's where tensors in general always help me out because they act on areas. So I have to evaluate them and integrate them around the boundary. So this in minus out, in minus out, it's really integration of the tens tensor acting on a surface that has a direction to it. So if you think about this uh, little, we had this So we had this element, this shell. If you think about normals to the sides of this element, so there is a normal, this is an outside normal, outside normal, outside normal, outside normal. Okay. You can see that the action of anything transferred in here and here is against the outside normal. And here and here I'm together with outside normal. So that's why you have opposite signs when you are looking for this contrib contributions in or out. Is it really in or out? Okay. We'll see in actual, actual integration because stress might be acting in such a way that you're actually losing something on this in boundary. So this in and out is just with respect to the coordinate system that I placed here. And what you're really doing is you're integrating the stress tensor times the normal to the boundary. Okay? And it's just that this normal to the boundary is sometimes aligned with the coordinate system and sometimes it's against the coordinate system because that's how this little shell is. Does this make sense? So really what I'm doing here, this whole process of in minus out, in minus out is integration of stress tensor t in the direction of the normal to the boundary. That because only stuff that is aligned with the normal to the surface is going through the surface. Okay. This long story that possibly has confused you, but this is if you have seen integral formulas. So this is what I'm going to call equation one. So this is my main. PDE describing Z momentum transfer. Is there anything about this partial differential equation or the form it's in right now that's specific for a Newtonian form? It's I don't see what's in there, do you? So right now, as stated, P is P. I don't even know that it's Newtonian fluid. Okay. All I know is I have a constant rho, so I'm assuming constant density there. Okay? I didn't integrate density or anything like that. Okay. So density is assumed constant. And if not, you throw in an average for that 
got volume or that area, okay? and you can still work with it. So right now, this is something that even if I told you, oh, big plastic or something weird sound, sounding like that, this is still valid. We're going to now specialize, and we're going to actually say, what is my P? And I'm going to have a specific assumed form for shear stress tensor in there, and that's where an assumption of Newtonian kicks in. Okay. So once I actually start specializing this. This is nice looking. It's relatively short and compact, but really tells me nothing about what my stresses are. Okay. So I've got to solve for it. And in order to solve, I have to make more assumptions. So right now it's very general. This is very general. We have not applied the assumption of Newtonian fluid yet. All right, so what is, in general, the form of phi? So if I just have a tensor form, what is my combined momentum stress? P. What else? How do I write convective? Okay. And then this molecular has two parts. What are the two parts? Pressure times identity plus tau plus. So these are my contributions. But I'm actually looking at individual. So this is the, just a tensor form. So these are matrices, right? I'm looking at phi xz and phi zz. So what is my phi xz? It's going to be xz component of this. What is xz component of pressure times identity matrix? Zero. Zero. Plus tau xz. Plus, and what is xz component of this? Vz. Okay. And then my phi zz is what is the z, z component of this? Just p. Well, yeah, p, z, sure. But we're just looking at the thermodynamic pressure, so I'm going to just look at it as p. Plus tau zz and plus rho vz vz, which is rho vz square. Now we're going to actually start throwing in some assumptions. Okay. So what are the assumptions? So I can immediately see if I have v, vx and vz, it's going to be a difficult life for me to solve this equation. And I already said that I'm so slow that I'm assuming that nothing is going down in this film. It's just kind of slowly moving down the slope. And I, I'm ignoring any kind of vertical uh, as an x direction movement. So I'm going to assume that my vx is 0. Well, and my vy is 0, but I'm kind of ignoring y direction is this altogether. So that's actually going to simplify my life here. I, all I'm going to have is, since Vx is 0, I'm going to have that this is equal to tau xz. And Vz is my only non-zero velocity, or the one that I'm solving for. And I am going to here assume that I kind of have this layering in fluid, and actually the entire layer that is parallel to my slope is moving at the same velocity. So I don't have acceleration down this slope. It's not that I don't have it. 
I'm, it's small enough that I'm ignoring it, okay? So I'm going to ignore, that's sort of to the first order, ignore acceleration down the slope in z direction, down z direction. So I'm just going to have, a, as far as z, I'm going to have a constant, but I'm going to have different velocities for different x value. So my vz is vz of x. So it kind of just depends on like which height I am, which how far I am from that. And again, this is reasonable for very gentle slopes and for thin films too. If film is thin, I'm going to say, okay, I'm not going to look at the much more. Why would this work for a non-gentle slope? Hmm? So because acceleration, if you're like this, you cannot ignore. If you're in slope like this, you acceleration down the slope is obviously a lot, right? So you, you can still try to ignore it, but you're not going to be very accurate. Ultimately, you always have to, you make certain assumptions and quite literally the moment you don't make this assumption, you cannot solve analytically. So you would have to actually, the correct approach to test this would actually to have a simulator that is not ignoring it, simulate and see what it is for the scenarios that you're looking at. So the slopes you're looking at and so forth. Okay, So that's essentially always doubt. First assume so you can actually see the simplified solution and how it looks like. So it gives you some intuition. But you always have to doubt what you're looking at. So you always have to actually double check. So double checking in this case would be actually going and solving. You can't do analytically so you go and solve numerically and see what the contributions really are. All right. So my phi xz is then tau xz, and here I have tau xz. What is tau xz based on? So now I'm applying Newton's Newton, Newtonian fluid. I'm hearing a lot and hearing nothing. Can I? Yes. So these are components of the Jacobian of velocity and Jacobian of velocity transpose, right? And then I'm going to have the rest that is the 2 thirds mu minus kappa times, does everybody remember that other part? And I'm going to ignore it because it's incompressible fluid, so divergence of V is zero. Or I don't have the change. Okay, so I'm just going to leave it as that. Okay. And then this part, of course, can go. So the only thing that remains here is minus mu dvz dx. Vx is zero, so I don't have it. Where's my phi zz? It's pressure. The same assumption. Of so pressure will be also a function of x, similarly as I assume that for velocity, I ha can, in order to have a consistent system, I have to have pressure as pressure of x minus mu two times dvz dz. And again, the, the rest of the incompressible part is zero plus rho vz square of x. vz doesn't depend on z, so this goes to zero. So all I have is here p of x plus rho vz square of x. Okay. All right, so now I can actually go back to my equation one. So I had partial derivative with respect to x of phi xz, right? And phi xz is my tau xz. 
minus partial derivative with respect to z of my phi z, z and phi z, z is p of x plus rho v z square of x plus rho g cosine beta is equal to zero. Good news is this depends only on x. So this is zero because I'm looking at the partial derivative with respect to z. So what's left so this is negative partial partial x tau xz plus rho g cosine beta is equal to zero. Essentially that partial x tau xz is equal to rho g cosine beta. So first thing that I can solve for is shear stress. And the shear stress is really simple to integrate. Here, I assumed really dependence only on, it, on x. So this partial derivative is really derivative with respect to x. Okay. So tau xz is rho g cosine beta x plus some constant. I'm going to call it c1. So this shear stress is here regardless of what type of fluid I assume. I did not apply the fact that this is a Newtonian fluid yet. Okay? So this shear stress is general, that is, I did not assume a Newtonian fluid yet. So how does this shear stress change? It changes only with respect to this x direction, right? Where is my minimum value based on this formula? X is zero, so that's top of my film. Okay, so I'm minimizing shear stress typically at the contact with another fluid. Okay, minimizing in absolute sense. Okay, and it's maximum in absolute sense at the solid surface. So that's often the case physically. That's often the case. Okay? So you could have the direction to it positive or negative depending whether. How is your coordinate system oriented with respect to your solid surface? So is that solid surface in the larger x direction parts or lower x direction parts, so to speak? Right? So that the, the actual direction or plus or minus in shear stress doesn't mean much other than this is how we positioned our coordinate system with respect to our geometry. But in terms of the absolute value, you're typically minimizing it at the fluid-fluid interface. And actually, when we have slow velocities with air, the fact that the shear stress is zero will often be our boundary condition. Okay? And you're maximizing it in contact with solid. Okay? So minimized at x is equal to zero and maximized at a solid surface. In our case, that's x is equal to delta. And this is, this I mean in absolute sense. Again, direction is relatively meaningless in physical sense. It just tells me where things are in the coordinate system that I chose. OK. We could have, yes. But uh, so that's this absolute sense. I would still have zero close to the, in terms of the absolute sense, your shear stress is maxima maximized physically at the solid surface. So let's say you change the problem to say you have two plates equally divided. So you might have delta minus x here. 
not just X. Okay? So you are physically still going to achieve the maximum absolute value on the solid surface. So why, so actually this is where we need uh, to actually completely solve this. We need a boundary condition, okay? And uh, my first boundary condition is that shear stress at liquid air interface is zero. We're going to look into this a little more. It really comes from the fact that shear stress has to be continuous. And viscosity of air is very small compared to the liquid itself. So when you have mu on one side and mu on the other side that multiply your, uh, your partial Vx, partial Vz business, then that's basically going to uh, be zero on one of the sides because air has nearly zero viscosity compared to liquid. Okay? So this comes from the fact that you actually have order of, different, order of magnitude difference in viscosity between <coughs> air and the liquid. Okay? Well, and if you have two gases, then even more so, <laughs> both close to zero. So that's a common assumption. So basically that gives me C1 as zero. So my tau, tau xz is really rho g cosine beta x. So it just changes linearly from x is equal to zero to x is equal to delta. And now I can solve for, now I need an assumption of a Newtonian fluid to actually solve for velocity distribution. So we're going to apply <coughs> Newton, Newtonian fluid assumption. So basically my tau xz is minus mu dv z dx is equal to rho g cosine beta x. This is really dvz of x dx because I only have dependence on x. So I can switch from partial to regular derivatives is minus rho g divided by mu cosine beta x. So my vz of x is mu x squared over 2 plus some constant C2. So now I need another boundary condition to actually solve this. Which one will that be? No slip, no slip is the mon co most common one. So my second boundary condition at x is equal to delta, so that's at solid surface, so that means that Vz of delta is equal to zero, which basically gives C2 to be positive version of this evaluated at delta, so my C2 is rho g cosine beta over mu delta square divided by 2. So that gives me the solution for Vz of x, which is rho g cosine beta divided by 2 mu delta square minus x square. So this is a classical parabolic profile, or half parabolic profile, okay? 
I'll have, so I'm maximizing my shear stress at the solid surface, but that's where actually my velocity goes to a halt. It's, it's a no slip, so it's a zero. Okay. And I'm minimizing, in absolute sense, my shear stress at the contact with, the, with air, and that's where my velocity is maximum in absolute value. Okay. Because at x is equal to zero, this velocity will be maximum. Okay. So this is maximized at x is equal to zero, which is contact with air, and minimized at solid wall, which is x is equal to delta. So the way it looks like is essentially velocity profile, it's maximum at delta, and then it's kind of parabolic and it goes to zero. Okay. Imagine it, it imagine it's curved. <laughs> okay. Okay. So parabolic profile. Well, half <laughs> parabolic. And now we can poke this in various ways. Since I have the distribution, I can look at where it's maximized, where it's minimized, what is the average. Okay? For average, I would look at the cross-sectional average, so I would integrate. Okay? So you can look at the volumetric flow rate. If you integrate across the surface, then you can find the average. If you take that integral and divide by the surface area and so forth. So you can look at can obtain maximum average total volumetric flow rate and so forth because we have detailed distribution we can do that and those are typically physical values that I'm interested in volumetric flow rate is something that is typically the easiest thing to measure so I'm gonna always compute volumetric flow rate in order to compare to any experimental measurements all right we're gonna continue Again, so the quiz should be live soon, and it's up until 3 o'clock.